Good afternoon, everyone. And I hope you have watched the uh, videos that I have uh, shared with you. And I also asked you as an assignment. There is only one person who has responded to it. So that person will get the chocolate. OK. Yes, anybody else has responded? Uh, sorry, I just saw the video uh, just before the class. Okay. I guess in the second half of it, uh, no, say... I don't want here. I want everything commented. Sure, sir. OK, yeah, this we will just discuss. I was hoping that you will all you would have done it yesterday and then we would have had a discussion. But still, uh, whatever you found, you can please post it. Yes. And that will be fine. Yes, sir. OK, yes, good. So in the last class, we have discussed about uh, DNA methylation. And we also have discussed about histone modifications and so on, right? And in the histone modifications, we discussed about acetylation, methylation, phosphorylation, the other possibilities. And the types of histones to start with, H2A, H2B, H3, and H4. In that H3 and H4 have predominant or more or significant in terms of histone modifications, at least to the knowledge base that we have at this time. Uh, there are, say, I also want you to know this H4K5. If somebody said it means this is histone H4, this is lysine at position 5. We would always count the uh, the numbering of proteins would be starting from one, two, and so on. It should start with the amino terminal of the protein towards the carboxyl terminal, or you, show, you say it is a N to C. In, in DNA or nucleic acids, we usually do it as five prime to three prime. So uh, we also have discussed about uh, that, that Acetylation is usually associated with gene expression, while methylation could have, uh, it is contextual. And phosphorylation happens only on serine, which is an hydroxyl amino acid. So we need to, um, we, what we are trying to do in this course also, or in this lecture right now, is trying to see what are the varieties that are available. We are not learning any specific examples as such yet. OK, so keep that in mind. And then uh, uh, in the future assignments, you will have to read one or two research papers and you have to present and so on. All these mechanisms and the way of standards, like how to, uh, what does this mean? H3, H, H327 mean, H3, K27 mean, and something like that. So you should. Try to imbibe these uh, standards and then try to be uh, be in a position where you could explain things much better. And we also discussed about the enzymes that are involved, um, histone methyl transferase, histone demethylases. Those are the ones that are um, that are responsible for the modifications, histone modifications. Similarly, we also have Histone, histone acetyl transferases and histone deacetylases. And protein kinase uh, phosphatases also are there. Those are the enzymes. So we, we also discussed when we were talking about in characterization about karyotyping, in that I discussed about heterochromatin and euchromatin. Heterochromatin is mostly silent and it's not expressed. Whereas euchromatin is much more accessible and there is a lot of expression from those regions. So there are two enzymes. Uh, I mean, the, the enzymes that uh, perform is histone acetyl transferase that acetylates the histone tails because of which you will have much more spread out chromatin. And deacetylases would do the reverse of it. And this is with gene expression. There is also, with methylation, you, there are several possibilities. It depends on the location, on which histone, and the position of the residue, the modification occurs. And 
with methylation if it is H3K4 or K36 then there is usually gene uh, expression whereas if it is if the methylation occurs on lysine 9 or or at position 27 then there is repression again these are not necessarily uh, hard and fast rules okay what we have to also understand is as i showed there are four different histones right there are two copies in each nucleosome and there are uh, different positions of lysines arginines and there are positions of serines and to that you can have combinations of phosphorylation in some cases both could be either acetylated or methylated and several of such histones uh, sorry nucleosomes could be side by side right so the, the consequence of whether gene expression is going to happen at that place or not or in that time or in conditions is multifactorial but it is as we are starting to enter we are at the tip of epigenetics in a way and while we try to uh, we should be in situation where we can follow the scientific literature to start with and if you remember from the uh, transcription uh, that we have learned before rna polymerase has several um, gtfs or general transcription factors or basal transcription factors there are several co-activators, and we also have activators. Activators bind to enhancers, and repressor binds to silencers. Okay. Then we we have to understand one thing: that several genes are there, all over, spread around, and say if we take one cell of human say approximately 20 or 25000 genes are there these genes are responsible for formation of 2 10 different cell types and if you take say for example our epithelial cell if you take epithelial cell genes responsible for making this epithelial cell should be expressed and other types like such as neuron or a gland and so on they should other type genes specific for other types of cells should be repressed so it actually involves a um, tight control orchestrated tight control and also we have to remember that there are several repressors several activators and um, i mean enhancers silencers and so on and also that there are diverse genetic architectures that means one may have one one may require one gene may require activators one gene may not be required uh, may not require an activator so there is a whole diversity of genes right so that is one thing it is worth keeping in mind when we are trying to discuss about the complexity of gene expression in eukaryotes in a simplistic way, we will try to look at uh, histone trail modifications and what they might actually do. We know that DNA is negatively charged because of the phosphate backbone. And histones are positively charged because of several basic amino acids such as lysine, arginine, histidine, and so on. So if you look at the histone tails, they have arginine, lysine, and they could be attracted to the negatively charged DNA. So the tails are actually not so extended outward. But if we have acetylated, then kind of the, the negative charge, the positive charge is, uh, is much more reduced right because of which they are not so attracted to the dna and they are extended much further like this right and then it becomes accessible to the uh, to other proteins to act upon and then change the dynamics of the how the chromatin is coiled and so on. and again the methylation also has some effect but it doesn't change the charge 
okay methylation is not it does not have any it is hydrophobic in a way and just the ch3 and the consequences of acetylation at least is this one that it can spread the um, histone tails much more wide and they can be accessible and those proteins which have bromo domains as we discussed in the last course bromo domains are the ones that recognize acetylated amino acid residues such as lysine on the histone tails so if any protein has a bromine domain like this so they they would come and bind here and the this could be the um the enzyme some other enzyme activity it could be further acetylase it could be a histone acetylase or a chromo chromatin uh, modifier remodeler and so on those enzymes that recognize the uh, methylated amino acid residues on the histone tails are referred to as the chromo domains so we know we have studied also that the chromatin could be reorganized this is a 30 nanometer uh, fiber we'll see in the next slide that's much more elaborate this is a 30 nanometer chromatin fiber right and it is densely packed this is one nucleosome this is second and this is the third nucleosome and they are tightly packed and you see that here are the proteins that uh, sorry the sites on dna that are required for uh binding or uh, can be recognized by the proteins like protein binding one here it's just a conceptual thing so dna specific binding uh, the protein binds here it could recruit a chromatin remodeling complex which will then make the second site also accessible and then uh, probably a histone d uh, sorry histone acetyl transferase could be brought in and then it will acetylate the histone tails because of which now the chromosomes uh, sorry the the chromosome is much more spread that's about 10 nanometer chromatin fiber what was densely packed is now much more loosely folded right that is how the conformation of the chromatin uh, can be altered by these modifiers so these are called as the modeling complexes the this one right histone acetyl transferase is different from that of modeling complex we'll see it here so the difference between these two enzymes is histone acetylase is chemically modifying it chemically modifying the histone tails and because of which it is becoming much more extended and then a transcription right accessible to transcriptional machinery and then expression of the gene may happen whereas chromatin remodeling complexes they would only change the way the several sequences are there or it is actually a physical or structural uh, change that is being made to the chromatin remodeling occurs that we have learned something like sliding of a nucleosome or reorientation of a DNA sequence and so on, right? These are the two ways how the several other proteins transcription could be uh, influenced. What was not accessible, the sequence here, promoter, could be made accessible. The other way, uh, that is what the remodeling complex can do. And what we are talking here is about the activator. So here is an activator and here is another activator. Both are activating the transcription and they are doing it differently by what they are recruiting. Some of them recruit histone acetylase because of which transcription would occur. Some of them would do by uh, chromatin remodeling complex by bringing in the chromatin remodeling complex to the site of the gene. We have also discussed a little bit in the um, last semester about insulator. Also in the last class as well. Promoter, we have an enhancer because of we, we, to which it 
an activator could bind, and the activator will allow the transcription of this gene. There is an alternate uh, genetic architecture, as I told. There are combinations of enhancers, repressors, insulators, and so on. Here is a sequence insulator. And if this insulator is bound by a protein, then the activator cannot interact with the promoter. Why cannot it do? For interaction to happen, there should be a looping. That means the DNA should bound. Say, for example, this is the gene and the promoter. This would have been the activate, uh, sorry, enhancer to which the activator would bind. And that will bring the transcriptional machinery and transcription happens. If this somewhere around here or so, a protein is bound, such as onto the insulator, then the looping may not occur because of which transcription remains off. There are also other possibilities where you will find that one enhancer, one activator bound to an enhancer could be activating either gene A or gene B. And which, which of these genes is activated by the said enhancer would be dependent on whether the insulator is bound, as whether the protein is bound to the insulator or not. If the insulator is bound, then gene A is act activated. If the insulator, this protein is not bound to the insulator, then gene B is activated, right? You can assume that by default, it would have activated gene B unless this protein is bound here. So what you need to remember is that the, there are diverse ways of genetic organizations where you might have one enhancer, which can influence either promoter one or promoter two. Similarly, also we have uh, other kind, one gene, one promoter being activated by two different enhancers, right? If the insulator is not present, it would have been activated by enhancer, a reactivator bound to enhancer P, otherwise by Q. So there are, these are the, some of the possibilities about how insulators might also facilitate or influence the gene expression. There are several other ones, the other uh, genetic patients, you can say, or elements. You, they are called as LCR and the GCR. This is locus control regions. I think it's there. OK, I'll put it up. So LCR are regions which control the expression of all these genes here. So these are immunoglobulin genes, right, which are involved in production of antibodies. The expression of these genes in, um, in other cells is not required. In other cells other than those that produce the antibodies are not required, right? So they should be shut down in other, all other types of cells. And that is done through locus control regions. That region, when it is switched off, all the genes near that are switched off. Similarly, there are other regions called as uh, uh, GCR or global control regions, which means they are much more, they control uh, much bigger areas on the chromosomes. We don't need to necessarily go into all the, all the details at this stage, but I also shared a, a link today on the Google Classroom, and I encourage you to take that uh, epigenetic control of uh, of gene expression, a Coursera course. It's fantastic. You can audit the course. The videos are available. The link has been shared with you. Please have a look at it for additional. And uh, if you wanted to pursue research in this epigenetic, in the area of epigenetics, cell differentiation or stem cell biology or even cancer, epigenetics becomes the center. And if you read, uh, if you follow that course, it will give you a really good idea about how you, what you want to do with your research career in the future. So I encourage you to do that. I have done that course, and that is why I recommend it uh, strongly that you have, you can try to do that. So um, there is this process of silencing. It's a, it's a kind of repression. And 
it happens in one place and the and it spreads through along the chromosome switching off multiple genes something what we have discussed about lcr and uh, gcr and we will just quickly have a uh, review also where you should all remember the methylation on the on cytosine three four five and six fifth carbon is methylated by de novo methyl transferase de novo means it is something like new right and histone modifications phosphorylation methylation and acetylation on the histone tails and then switch genes can be switched on or off by the way how densely packed they are here you see that they are much more loosely packed you can assume it to be euchromatin heterochromatin would be much more tightly packed or in a it's kind of silent condensed chromosome so there are a few things that we will discuss uh, more which is which you have you try to get the terminology right and try to see some of the concepts so that it will allow you to be familiar with what those terms mean this is usually cpg islands c for cytosine g for guanine and p is the phosphorus bond between them and when you say G C G or cpg islands it would mean that there is they are gc rich they are usually associated with controlled or regulated um, regulatory elements of certain genes and whereas the coding part of the gene is usually cg4 and assume a cell has uh, is newly differentiating into a different type of cell okay and then some of assume that this gene should be repressed in that uh, into the changing or the differentiating cell then de novo methyl transferases that means these are the enzymes methyl transferases that are establishing a methylation pattern in the cpg island and they have methylated this one and after say for example something like this after each round of cell division you would get on it is semi conservative replication and you would we would end up with something like this so it is hemimethylated. I hope you remember what is meant by hemimethylated DNA, where one strand is methylated, whereas the other strand is unmethylated. If you said something like semi-methylated, it would mean partial methylation on both the strands. Okay, but that's not the term we are using here. Hemimethylated is one side methylated and the other side unmethylated. So uh, there are other enzymes called as uh, that are methyl maintenance methylation they would identify such regions and they would add the methylation and they are that is called as maintenance methylation dnm1 and so on okay so uh, once the methylation has occurred it becomes uh, what you say it becomes repressed In some cancers, also in cancer biology, if you are already studying it or you are going to study in the future, and if you are interested in research, cancer biology, cancer is about, it could be about mutations, mostly these. There are a lot of genetic rearrangements and mutations occur. But it also has to do with epigenetic modifications. Those genes that should be turned off may not be, have been turned off. Those genes that should be expressed may not have been expressed. And that also, nowadays, it's a very common thing to work, mix up um, cancer biology and epigenetics. It's not just about mutations. Mutation may have an effect, epigenetic effect, in the sense it could affect some of the genes or proteins which are involved in epigenetics. And then there is a huge epigenetic modification because of which there are further uh, problems in with cancer. So people also work uh, for cancer therapy as well. 
we will read about it in the third uh, unit a little bit about cancer stem cells. So I'm trying to, in the next uh, 10 minutes, and that's what I will, I'll stop there. We are going to discuss about the overall picture of epigenetic regulation. And what I first want you to understand is that a cell, a zygote, for example, it will divide into, say, primordial germ cells, ectoderm, mesoderm, endoderm, and this will give rise to its own cell types. And these cells will give rise to their own cell lineage. And these will go. It is a progressively differentiating uh, things, right? Cells will keep on differentiating. So how does it happen so orderly? The regulation and a cell that is in this stage different of differentiation. This is the uh, degree of differentiation. If they, if you take a cell here and try to put it in the place of here as in, in the embryo, what would it become? What I'm trying to get to is that a cell is there and cell is present within a three-dimensional boundary and it has continuous interactions with its niche. Niche is the location where it is. It experiences physical and chemical forces or factors and all together would constitute the niche. There are two factors. One are the external factors that is coming from the outside. It could be cell-cell interactions. It could be biochemicals, hormones, morphogens, and so on. It could also be from internal. Internal means all the genes that are already expressed within this cell. So the way the cell differentiates from one cell to another cell is a product of two things, external and the internal factors. Internal is what are all the genes already expressed and what kind of proteome and transcriptome the cell has and what kind of signals it is receiving from the outside will determine how the cell should, what the cell will become, okay? In these interactions, we have, the cell has several cell surface receptors, something like GPCRs, RTKs, and so on. And there could be, uh, there could be cell surface receptors, there could be cytoplasmic receptors also. So the cell is continuously receiving these signals from outside. And they, as a signaling cascade, could influence the some of the genes or the proteins that are involved in epigenetic modifications, such as histone methyltransferases, histone demethylases, uh, histone deestylases, estylases, and so on, right? ATP-dependent chromatin remodeling protein phosphatases, DNA methylases, and so on. So eventually, not only that these gene uh, signaling pathways have an expression of target genes, or probably these are also influenced, uh, could be the target genes as well. And once that change ha occurs, and there are, uh, we will just look into another part of it, how we categorize the genes. Active genes, those that are continuously expressed, and silent genes that are continuously silenced. Every cell, as, as I was describing before, every cell, say epithelial, if you said, all the genes responsible for maintaining it as epithelium will be expressed. Genes such as neuron or a gland, they would be repressed. So in that case, all those genes will be such as a gland or other things, they will all be become silent genes in that particular cell. So every cell has different types, different kinds of genes. There are active genes, which would include uh, tissue-specific genes. There are housekeeping genes for the production of energy and so on. There will be other genes to make cell contacts and so on. There are also 
pious genes which are bivalent that means if there is a signal they would be expressed if there are no signals there are they will not be expressed okay so those are pious genes so uh, yes and then i'm getting to how it could change wait a second yes so eventually all these modifications say from signals the modifiers or enzymes that are involved in epigenetic regulation are changed they would influence the genes that mostly that of poise genes they might convert an active gene into an into silent gene or silent gene into active gene and then eventually they will make a signature that's we call it as you can also call it as uh, epigenetic signature or nuclear program i would like to call that which is including dna methylation histone modification the best characterized or understood ones this is also some other things that you need to there are also some other things that we need to remember that histones can also be modified by other ways but they are not well characterized we will stick to these three and nuclear positioning which i think i have described and in the uh, in the coursera course if you do it there is a nice uh, presentation of research as well on nuclear positioning there are locations on the periphery where the genes the genome that is on the periphery is mostly of silent ones the ones that are there are transcriptional hubs into which the active genes that we just like we discussed in the previous slide they all are present they are all brought into that as the part of the genome they are in the they are located in the transcription hub and then um, so the position where the gene is present will also matter in that sense there is one another is non coding rna we will talk about it in when we are discussing about x chromosome inactivation as well where uh, where they are involved in um, epigenetic modifications that is they bind to certain regions of dna and because of which they could turn off the expression of those genes we will talk about it later also and rna research you know, if if somebody is working with rna that's a fantastic area of uh, research and if you are talking about cancer yes and epigenetics these are all many a times interrelated so try to uh, work more and try to find what you would like when it what you would only know when you read the scientific literature you don't you can only follow the scientific literature if you have already had some foundation in the way the terminology is used the meaning of them the essence of it right so this is the uh, total of it where this is what i'm trying to put from a poster i like this poster a lot because it summarizes many things uh, for us and i want to quickly review imprinting that we have already discussed it is an epigenetic differentiation and the expression depends upon the parent of origin right so because this is also part of the lesson so and we learned about it when we were discussing about uniparental zygoids so the normal zygoid we see that a normal zygote a diploid one there is a normal amount of placenta and the size of the fetus is considered normal it's like the control what happens to androgenetic what happens to gynogenetic is what we discussed parthenogenetic is technically gynogenetic as well so androgenetic is where both the sets genome sets are derived from maternal uh, they consist of maternal sets whereas gynogenetic and parthenogenetic both have maternal type and if you see the way embryo grows in this case placenta grows aggressively and large whereas the embryo is small and 
if you see the gynogenetic one, you'll see the placenta is small and uh, relatively embryo is bigger. So both androgenetic and gynogenetic have problems. And that is because of imprinting. And imprinting is an epigenetic modification. I hope with this imprinting, I already discussed this picture, uh, this image twice at least. Do you have any particularly confusing area of um, area so that I can specifically speak in that term? Anybody? Yes. Any questions? No, sir. OK. Could you give an overview again? Um, yes, tell me which one. Slightly was. remember what it was, but not accurately. Yes. Um, I will just, you, you can consider this as a primer. Forget about what has been taught before. So we'll just start fresh, and then we'll finish it. OK. Every embryo or organism is biparental. And that means one set is from maternal and one set is from paternal. Now there are imprints made. Some genes are expressed from, I'll put it as paternal, and some genes are expressed from maternal. Gene A, A, B, and B, just for sake of understanding. So in every so if this organism is making uh, say gametes, what would you expect the gametes to have say to get the gene where A is repressed and B is expressed, or should it have where the uh, sorry A is expressed and B is repressed, right? In one of the gamete, this could go. In another one, this could go. But that's not how things happen. For reasons we will see, we will discuss later. What happens instead is, when I say imprint here, it means DNA is made. here we if you say it as dna methylation so in a in the paternal one and the sorry maternal and paternal we said uh, this is imprinted in the paternal one b and in a in maternal one this is imprinted what happens is that both all the imprints sorry all the the imprints are erased the dna methylation is removed and therefore you don't know which one is inherited from male uh, maternal side which one is inherited from paternal side you just now it is becoming as parent specific parent who is the parent that is making these gametes it is this embryo so the body of this embryo as is the product of its mother and father. And the primordial germ cells is the product of this individual. So during the formation of primordial germ cells, we will discuss that later too, all the imprints are erased. And then during gametogenesis or formation of the gametes, imprints are established. How would they be established if it is I'll just take it as a female, for example, egg. Uh, this is female, sorry. And this is egg. We will not discuss this at this time. And you have A, A, B, and B. We said for female, what is the imprint? A should be methylated. So in both the cases, A will be methylated. 
So if the uh, sperm is coming from somewhere else outside, in that case, you would have B is imprinted. A is expressed, whereas B is imprinted. And if fertilization occurred, like in this case, one will come from the sperm, one set, right? This is still deployed. Upon gametogenesis, you will have some combination like this. And one set from here will come, and that is when fertilization would occur, in which case you would have B repressed in one and expressed from one, and A expressed from one case. OK, I should put the reverse of it. So what would happen is that uh, this would have been the A. A is repressed here, expressed here. B is expressed here and repressed here. And it will form a new embryo and a new individual, right? This genomic imprinting keeps happening. And it is it plays an important role in, it prevents, um, self-fertilization to start with. What are the advantages of uh, epigen uh, sorry, this genomic imprinting? I will leave it as a question. In the next class, I would like you to explore the internet and find out the reasoning or some kind of explanation for imprinting, genomic imprinting. Why is it there? What is the benefit of it? Or what is the... Uh, it is an actually an interesting question. People try to propose different examples and uh, different ways of uh, explanations. And I think it will be nice if you could read some literature on that. OK? But otherwise, we'll discuss uh, again as well. Any further questions? Anybody? I'll stop recording. And any questions regarding CIA? It would be nice if you speak and say something so I will know your opinions. Otherwise, we'll you know, be able to know each other. OK, then, if not, you can also message me, OK? Yes, what will be the portions? The first unit, up to what we have. Until what we have discussed uh, in, in Monday, including the problems that, I have, that are there in the uh, shared video system. Recorded. Yes, yes. OK? OK, sir. Yes, good.